you're obviously a, 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 a sort of martial artist in many respects. Um, you know, we're Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners ourselves. You're a brown belt, I believe, at the moment. Yes, I am. Perfect. And you've uh, competed in Muay Thai, but you're also, uh, a, a, is it a black belt or a black grading Krav Maga as well? Is that right? Yes, it's, uh, I've got my black belt from Krav Maga. Yes. Yeah, perfect. So this is a martial art that I'm a little familiar with, but not one that we've actually discussed on this podcast yet. So that's where we'd like to start, if it's okay. Um, tell us what, what Krav Maga is as a martial art. Well, Krav Maga, to be honest with you, it's... Um, the name itself, because it was uh, brought in by, you know, a Yugoslavian a Jewish uh, a practitioner was Amy Lichtenfeld. He's the one that found it. But Krav Maga, basically, it's your unarmed uh, military combatives. It is just maybe the Israeli version of the name of it, co you know, contact combat. But Krav Maga, it is combatives. If you look, to be honest with you, everybody likes to put labels and stuff. If you go to any books of any unarmed uh, military uh, combatives, that's what it is. It's basically you pick up what works in a sort of martial arts effectively in a, you know, war scene or civilian scene and just get to the shortcut. Yeah. And I think this is, this is, this is where I'm familiar with it because I think I was aware that it was something that the Israeli army used. And, and I believe it was because it was, you're able to train it to quite a good level of proficiency quite quickly. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know, uh, I think there was a film uh, a few years ago with, um, I think it was Halle Berry, maybe. Or, uh, oh, Jennifer Lopez. Lopez. Yes, that's, that's where one. it kicked off. That's where it yes. kicked off that movie enough. Yes, that's what gave uh, Krav its big fame. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I forget the name of the film, but it was essentially, uh, I think she was like um, being abused by a partner or something. In, mm -hmm. in, in yeah, Krav enough. Uh, I think the, name, the, the movie's name is Enough. Yes, it is. Right, right, on. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've not watched that, yeah. So it become quite quite a thing then, and, and certainly in this sort of self defense space. Um, and I've heard it kind of coined as a bit of a couch potatoes martial art in the sense that you don't really need to use a lot of like strength or physical attributes to be effective. Is that your is that your kind of view of the martial art as well? <sighs> to be honest with you, I'm, uh, I, I I teach it and train very different. You know, so I will to be honest with you. Uh, in a way, what you're saying puts up the, the wrong view because I hit hard in conditioning. Even though, you know, I come from a jiu-jitsu background and judo, we've always been hit hard, you know, with conditioning. And I do believe people need to be fit to fight. It doesn't mean you need to have, you know, big ass pack, six pack abs to fight. But uh, when people say, oh, I can just come for two, three classes and know oh, how to defend myself. Uh, not really. <laughs> yeah. Not really. <laughs> if you, the, the number one self defense, to be honest, is get out of the scene. If you can't run, yeah, hundred percent. So, so tell us about sort of what the what sort of typical session of of Krav Maga training would look like for you. So, first typical session, I when we start, we start with a warm up. We hit it about fifteen uh, minutes calisthenics. Um, it depends what we're teaching. Um, the, that day or that night, for instance, if we were going to be doing grounds, we're going to be focusing on a lot of core work and uh, ground work. So we will start with warm ups. Then you get into some kind of uh, techniques. Either you want to do dirty boxing. You know, striking is a must because it's it's mostly stand up. That's what we encourage. It. But when it gets to the ground, there is also a whole cover there. But so if you're going to be doing some uh, striking. Now be going through it, combos and working at it. Then you're going to start addressing it combatively, how different it is. You can teach kickboxing, but when you get somebody, an erratic attacker that doesn't follow your one, two, three, it goes off the window really fast. So then after that, um, cool down a bit, and then we get to some self-defense technique. It just depends if it's an attack on the ground, attack with blade, if it's a control restraint, which I'm very big on. Um, you know, so a lot of um, the striking and all the fights we got lately in the United States have backfired on uh, people pretty, uh, trying to defend themselves legally. What was that last bit you said there about something's backfired on somebody? Sorry, mate. So uh, here's a couple of things, you know, a lot of self-defense instructors fail to tell their students. And I do also see that in jiu-jitsu. Sometimes I hear instructors who tell, yeah, man, you got this guy. And if you got him on bar, boom, just break it. Well, that usually doesn't translate really well when it comes to court. So, I mean, <laughs> if, if you survived, let's say the legal uh, part, you got out. They claimed you're innocent. Fine. 
you've already blew up a couple of thousand dollars. Then that same person is maybe not satisfied. Whoever you broke his arm is going to come back at you after you civilly. Now that's you're going to shell out more a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah. So uh, this is where it goes when I, I'm very um, critical and hard on when it comes to control and restraints. If you're able to pretzel a person instead of punching them in the face or busting them open, uh, that, that, that's actually doesn't will, will, will appear that bad. I, I had a student that got into it too, and he almost faced hot water. So luckily he had good restraint. Yeah, no, 100%. And some of the, and you're going to have to excuse our ignorance throughout this conversation for us because, um, you know, it's, it's definitely a new martial art to us. It's not one something that we studied at all. But there was a school, I think, locally to us that was teaching it a couple of years back. And I remember they, they did a lot of scenario based training. So even sort of fighting in cars and, you know, up alleyways and obviously with weapons and that type of thing. And, and some of the strikes that they would encourage. Uh, it, it sort of aligned with exactly what you were saying there, where they were arguably a bit excessive, uh, like striking to the throat and yep. obviously to the genitalia and that, and that type of thing. And then I remember thinking, I don't know where I could use those techniques because it's not, again, it's not something that I would want to get involved with on the street. And do you typically see that there's a, you know, still a lot of self-defense schools, whether it's Krav Maga or anything, teaching techniques that you just can't really use in everyday life? Oh, I will be flat out honest to tell you, Krav Maga is the front runner for this crap. I'll tell you that, absolutely. And um, I appeared on the scene here, I don't know if you want to use the word popularity or somebody get to know, <laughs> back when I returned from Brazil, late 2012, 2013. And I was very critical in the fact for all these Krav Maga dojos, if you want to call them, that if you do not implement some, you know how they call sports combat to us, jiu-jitsu and MMA, to your student, <laughs> you really uh, are, are not teaching them correctly because they're going to spar, they're going to notice not all the kick to the groin going to work. I mean, you might kick me in the groin. How many, let's see UFC fights. Some people get hit, just a couple of seconds, they can shake it off and come in, but there's a ref to stop it. Again, let me get to that, see? So you kick me in the groin. Boom. I look at you. I go up from rage 100 to 1,000. And I'm coming at, flooring at you. How are you going to stop me? And whatever cocktail I got on. And especially when they teach it to the women. And I'm like, I, we do women's self-defense. And um, I am very critical on just to get them out of the situation. More than sitting fine. Because they fail to say, it's like, yes, you can train cop like when the movie with J-Lo. Her... her Attacker, six foot something, untrained. All right, she did a training. She did an action movie comeback. That's not how it translates in real life. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Well, let's say right. a six foot six. All right, no, six foot two. Let's go six foot two to 100 pounder. Grab the five foot four female. What groin, what eyes. I mean, I will say, yes, we push them to teach them to fight back or survive. Get out. That's absolutely. I'm not going to tell her they just to submit. But I'm going to tell you that grabbing the thing, twisting the finger and all that stuff, that, that's not work. I mean, you guys are jiu-jitsu practitioners. Do you think twisting one of our fingers is going to stop a rear naked short? <laughs> it's insane. I think that's what happens though, isn't it? Is That's what happens is when you, I think when people experience jiu-jitsu and, uh, and then, you know, every, not, not everything else seems a bit silly, but like exactly what you just said, like if you get someone in a rear naked and they know what they're doing, there's, there's no stopping it. And then you got these fucking idiots coming out with stupid videos like oh, feeling energy. <laughs> I was watching one earlier. I think I put it on my fucking story. Yeah, you feel the energy and push him and all this fucking bollocks. And I'm like, God, man, it just ruins it for everyone, doesn't it? When I um, got to deal with BJJ Fanatic, and they, because <clears throat> I, I was uh, between, um, I don't know how to wear it, but you say between, let's say, a rock and a water, they're sitting thinking, when they offered me to do, and they were, they wanted it to be called Krav Maga. I wanted it just to be Grand Combatives because that's where I focus more because of my jiu-jitsu background and, and, and judo. So I said, okay, because they want to, the Krav is the up thing, let's go with it, fine. I did the first DVD from the trainings I had from a couple of the monitors all through life, and I put it together. It's a Grand Combatives DVD. Now, in the first guy, the jiu-jitsu guys were talking, ah, that stuff don't work. I was like, can you just watch it? Because you just saw the word crop. I get it, but I'm <laughs> one of you guys. Then I get the crop people attacking. 
nobody should go to the ground. And I'm like, oh my God. So, but what I address there, again, and I repeat it, if any self-defense dojo does not teach his students jiu-jitsu, they're doing them a disservice. And in my academy, I got two programs. We are a jiu-jitsu academy, and we teach Krav Maga. And my students, when they go up to their first rank, it's mandatory minimum. They're going to do about 20-plus hours of jiu-jitsu. The basics. I'm not asking them. And suddenly you see how it goes. It goes from there. Now they want to be blue and purple belts. And it just, it's, it's just how it is because they see things. You know, they walk in, oh, I'm a second rank in Krav Maga, and I'm bigger. And then they get this 100, and one of our female instructors, she is 120 pounds. Uh, she's a purple belt. She assists me with the kid. She just literally slithered like a snake and strangled one of our big guys. And he just, he's like, how is this happening? Yeah, it's it's crazy how that happens, isn't it? You you ju generally just people people don't realize do they? you know mm -hmm. how uh, how effective jujitsu is in most fights like you said before most fights end up on the ground i've i've been at a few fights over the years and they always end up on the ground yes 100%. and that's where if you can actually pin someone and hold someone and be able to <laughs> just control them it's mm -hmm. if someone can could if before i started jujitsu and someone knew jujitsu and they got me on the ground i'm fucked but i didn't know that at the time i would have i would have thought it was fucking witchcraft or something now they were keeping me down you know what i mean if you fucking got me in a cross face or a neon belly or mounted me, I don't know. There was a, there was a boy at our school, at my son's, at, at my wife's school recently. And he got, he got really badly beaten up. And uh, how he done it is the lad got him in mount and just beat, just, just punched him, just punched him, punched him, punched him. It went viral, the video. The boy got in a lot of trouble. But I use that video, well, that, that experience to my son and say, like, this is why you got to learn jiu-jitsu. Because yeah. if, you know, if you know a mount escape... <laughs> You're not, you're not having that same situation. Even if he is bigger than you, it don't matter. It's one thing jiu-jitsu does, and truly, and, you know, when you gentlemen ask me, it's, you know, when you ask me about Krav, um, it's kind of new to you guys, and I get it. I understand 100%, and I think Krav is getting on the way out because of all the BS that keeps coming out. But anyway, going to the point, jiu-jitsu does something the opposite of Krav. That's why I let my students do both. Krav, basically, it's speed. Go, 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 go. And attack just happened. I need to get out. That's correct, and I applaud that. Absolutely. Well, just like Danny said, well, I went to the ground. You know? But when ju what jiu-jitsu does, at least when it hit to that level, you don't get into freak out mode and just, you know, have you ever seen a white belt? They come in so erratic, and then once you put them on their back, what happened? They are sitting there flopping like a starfish, and they do nothing. They don't know what to do. You don't want to be that person. And jujitsu in that way helps you. All right, I'm in my zone now. Let me try to control what's going on. And to, it's to, to be honest, for both arts, I truly believe when jujitsu dojos also need to go to the roots. And I'm, I'm going to explain one thing. And when it comes to self-defense, there is striking in jujitsu. All these arts, that, like say, combat is what it took, you go open the ja old Japanese jiu-jitsu books or, old, uh, or j the beginning of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, a lot of the techniques are from there. Nobody recreated the wheel when it comes to the current combatives or whatever. Um, uh, sorry, guys, I've got to put my battery up here. Uh, combatives or self-defense. So if you literally see all the palm strikes, you see the oblique kicks, you see the headlock escapes, it's there. And now when jiu-jitsu dojos, for instance, academies, let me go and say that, say... Yes, you're used to self-defense, absolutely. But are you even teaching them how to block? If somebody mounted them, I, we know mount escapes. But what if it, when their elbows and forearms and knuckles start coming to their face? They'll freak out. So I truly believe there needs to be a balance between both. I mean, not, I'm a big number one supporter for jiu-jitsu. I'm a brown belt for this level. I put in so much time in it, believe in it. <laughs> but when we want to say it's a self-defense, we have to be so honest as well to add certain things. It has it. It doesn't mean that it's not there, but some instructors don't go to that level. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's a really valid point, and and we've had uh, a number of conversations. Uh, we we had a, a conversation with um, a chap called Brandon Reed, who's um, a three time national wrestling champion over in the states, um, and he talked a lot about how one of his frustrations with jujitsu when he when he come, when he come across to it was that a lot of schools would be advertising for self defense, but they never taught any takedowns. Absolutely. 
And yep. uh, we, we also had uh, a chap who's a, a, a local um, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu brown belt. Um, and, and locally, most of the, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu schools are more sport-based Jiu-Jitsu. Mm-hmm. Um, so where Danny and I train, it's, it's primarily sport-based Jiu-Jitsu, but it's, it's part of a wider martial arts club where we also box and tie box and wrestle and do judo. So, you know, the, the, the kind of smarter students will do cross-training across all of the disciplines. But we, we had a, a really good conversation with, uh, with Matt, who was the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu guy, because his syllabus where he trains – it's just jujitsu, but they strike and they do weaponry work. Yeah, and Gracie combatives. Yep. Yeah, and and it caused a bit of a, a little bit of a debate because, you know, he you know that jujitsu is that for him, whereas for us, jujitsu is the groundwork and it's it's more the sport jujitsu. And what he was describing for me is more like mixed martial arts. Yeah. Well, how about yourself? What are you? Are you are you more sort of that that Gracie competitive, or are you more sport based then with a mixture of other arts? What do you tend to do? Um, so to be honest with you, it really depends. So in my Krav Maga program, it is the mix of the, you know, the jiu-jitsu combatives and every, basically in judo has all the arts that is involved has combatives. Even back then when we did Muay Thai, because we have reverse clinch that you even do, don't do it in a Muay Thai match. As we do the front clinch, there's a back clinch, which you take somebody's head really down in a dangerous way. But that being said, in my uh, self-defense program, which is that di- dictate directly for self-defense, yeah, I teach them all that. Now, I got, I teach, I run the jiu-jitsu afternoon class. Our black belt runs the evening class. I just teach them the sports jiu-jitsu, but I also, comes a time every now and then, I address the self-defense application to it if those students ask it about that. Um, one of my goals, actually, to build a program, and it's u- utilizing jiu-jitsu combatives, because a couple of the things I've learned even from bodyguarding, what I've learned in England, how they use judo a lot because of the jackets. And I've released a curriculum of BJ Fanatic. I call it the jacket, which is I've learned even from my past mentors how you utilize it. That comes from judo jiu-jitsu. So that's a self-defense aspect I also think jiu-jitsu is missing. Yeah, we got these on, but we're with these geese, and we can do that. But how is it with a T-shirt? How is it with a jacket? How is it with a jacket that has a zip line on it? Well, it's painful. You've seen the police in Brazil when they, they all get in a sandbox and they wear all their like uniform boots and everything and they just grapple and then anything kind of goes and they, they do that. It's really fucking cool. It's really cool because they, they do it like like with their jackets on or t-shirts and then they got their fucking big boots, but yeah, they're just grappling in a big sand pit. Looks fucking insane. They do like tournaments like just for the police though. It's really fucking cool. My uh, exposure to jiu-jitsu was more self Well, it was a mix. So in 2009, I was in Brazil and, you know, I was just a, the wrestler and a striker and all that and grappling. There's kitchen. I was like, what is this going to do, you know? So I went in and had somebody, like, twice smaller than my size just toyed with me. So I started getting believing in it. So we put the gi on. But what I noticed, the classes there is different. So we do the warm-ups. We do our jiu-jitsu training. Toward the end of the class, the last 30 minutes is self-defense technique with the gi. And sometimes they say, put gloves, somebody comes swing at you, how you double leg them and take them down. It's different than somebody just trying to grab you or just, you know, then somebody. So that's one thing I've started, where I started on when I first did Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I don't see it here where I am at in the States. Uh, I don't know if it's the same up in England. I'm assuming that's how Jiu-Jitsu is growing. But that's, that's I truly believe that's what's missing. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't disagree at all. And... You know, when we've had discussions previously, whether, you know, jiu-jitsu is a, a good self-defense martial art, it's, it's sometimes hard for me to say because I, I, I boxed from about 13 um, and then I picked up Muay Thai from like 19 and then started picking up jiu-jitsu then in my early 20s. Eventually competed in mixed martial arts. So I had a, you know, could wrestle and I could do everything. So for me, jiu-jitsu is very effective because I can, I can not get hit. I can cover up, I can get a hold of somebody, I can close distance. Yes. So it's great, but... You know, we certainly know people who have no striking ability at all. You know, they're they're dirty guard pullers, and you know, if it comes to a real a real situation in a, in a street fight, um, you know, they, they probably wouldn't be stupid enough to try and pull guard, but they they may attempt a very poor takedown and fail and end up getting hit as a result. And that's when I agree. I think you definitely need like a mixture of martial arts. And I and I truly also one thing will give Krav Maga done combatives in general, that no self-defense martial arts has done. Every self-martial arts defense are scenarios. And I understand Kraft is the same. But when we train 
we something we put our students to duress. Uh, if you think about a fight when it starts, it's not going to be just somebody tapping. I mean, yes, somebody can tap in a shot or sucker punch you, but that's the end of the day. But when the fight starts, there's a lot of screaming. There's a lot of foul language. There's a lot of things going on around. And one thing we do in our classes when we start drilling hard, that's why I even put them through a test as well, under duress, like, we put them through a rigorous warm-up. Then as they're trying to break out from holes, we're sitting there yelling at them. I mean, people, when they see these videos, they think it's hazing. They think it's that. No, it's not. We're not even, I even tell them, we can use the worst foul language there, but hey, I'm not doing this out of my enjoyment. But violent is not pretty. <laughs> and they're not going to say sweet nothings to you when they want to take your head off. So that's one thing I also believe a lot of self-defense forgets. And uh, it never looks clean. It never looks clean. It doesn't going to be a one-two. If you pull the knife this way, you're going to be doing it this way. Yeah, we kind of think, but a knife is a knife. Even a kitchen knife won't do enough damage with no training. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I, I agree. And I just wanted to go back to like the, the female self-defense stuff because this is like, this is this is one thing that I, I don't know, I, I'm really kind of a bit lost with, to be honest, because I, I see a lot of, we talked about it earlier, where you, you see these techniques being taught to females to defend themselves against typically male assailants. And I see sometimes the techniques, and, and I agree that I think this wouldn't work against somebody that was very large and very angry. Um, but you obviously need to teach females something, right? Um, yes. You know, and, and obviously the first thing would be to diffuse, evade, you know, and, and, and try and get away. But... What do you typically, you know, what do you think like females should be learning from a self-defense perspective? To be honest with you, before all that, awareness. There's a lot of that. Most of my seminars, when people see me post about it, a lot of them are lectures. And because I'll be honest with them, it's like, yeah, I will teach you certain techniques. That's the common things that can happen if somebody trying to grab or stuff. But I'm going to tell you. An hour workshop is not going to be the one that's going to make you stand up against a, a, a serious assignment. So when you ask the first thing, the first thing, I hit harder awareness. Um, for one of your number one uh, cause for the failure of awareness I, I've shared this story to him. I had a student. <laughs> so this student came to my academy saying she has stalker issues. And that's when I was like, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that deal that signed up. So during my class, I was talking about the back in the time when they had those big ass headphones, a couple of years ago, you know, those whatever, Dre Beats and that, and this one. And I said, you need to stop with that when you go walk around in public. And she was there. Coincidentally, that Friday, a couple of days later on Friday of that week, I was having lunch at this cafe, and I'm looking through the glass, and guess what I see? My student on her phone with the headphones on. I run out. I get my arm around her throat and snatch her. I took her feet backwards, and she was screaming. For, of course, somebody called the cops. I thought it was a kidnapping <laughs> attempt. And then when I turned around, she was so full of tears. I looked, and I was like, it was just like that. And... Ever since then, she stopped. <laughs> but, 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 you know, it wasn't, I, 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 I'm very harsh, not harsh, like I'm on my students' offices, even if they don't train, where are you? But, but, but the thing is, accountability and reality is needed. When you want to become a self-defense instructor, you got to have good ethics to be honest with yourself and your students. Even if the curriculum has things, yeah, we need to move it, but you got to tell them, I mean, so I, Awareness is their first self-defense if you want to teach a woman. When it comes to being in the public parking lots, um, going to restrooms these days. So there's a lot of things. That if they pay attention to it and see those red flags, I will get them out. And I think the women have something men don't have. And it's that woman's intuition. Uh, it's, it's true. They feel like we get it was like I had a gut. Women get that feeling. And if they pay attention to it, 
<laughs> they get that feeling, but we li- they listen. We just think, ah, oh, fuck it. We'll just yeah, we'll carry on. We'll be yeah. Yeah, what, what, we'll what we'll get we get there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just think, yeah, we're fucking. We'll, we'll handle yeah, it. We're doing shit somewhere else at that time. So, but yeah, but yeah. But yeah, to be honest with it, but somebody said, oh, the first thing we want to teach him how to not get strangled. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> it, it's. We have to be honest with it, you know. Yes, they can learn this, but training is training. But me just sitting with and teach you that one technique. Keep your distance. Keep your awareness up. If they don't, you know, run. And 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 I've noticed even when I say go back to jujitsu again, the students I have that just do crop, female wise. And the females that I have that do jiu-jitsu, and some of them ended up doing combat sports because jiu-jitsu pushes that. You feel, okay, I can take it. I can, let me try a tournament, and then suddenly you see them kickboxer. So that's one of the beauty of it. But I'll tell you, the freak out and the discipline mentally, the students that train both, way different than the students that just do crop. Way different. Yeah, something that, there's something else that we've talked about previously as well is, um, you know, the the, the Gracie... Uh, jiu-jitsu guy that came on he talked about the sort of battle testing that they did in in the academy where they create these scenarios and you know sort of sensory overload people in and then get them to to kind of you know sort of defend themselves and you know the conversation we had at that point does that still compare to like a real life scenario and of course it it doesn't but competition like uh you know sort of jiu-jitsu or obviously mma is even better again but competition do you think that would prepare somebody better or worse than that sort of scenario for, for real combat? I'll tell you one thing competition will do is deal with that adrenaline a little bit. Of course, it's different than a fight scenario that just pops up out of nowhere. So, but competition can add, I feel as when I did competition, um, it knocked out just for me. It's just that adrenaline fear, you know, okay, I'm about to face up. It does not replace a real fight, 100%, but it helps to a degree. Yeah. yeah and you're trying to get some... somebody willing to hurt you. I mean, when we go in competition, I'm going to, if you think about it, I got to break a joint or choke him out. Yeah. And he has to do the same. Yeah, there's a tap of, you know, I submit, but that's the same fault. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. We, yeah, we uh, we just at our academy uh, yesterday. We had like a, a white belt quintet tournament, like an interclub, mm. and uh, and lots of our guys uh, competed for the first time. And you know, I was I'm, I'm one of the coaches, so I was kind of just supporting them from a psychology perspective. And it was just fascinating just seeing like the, the wide range of, <laughs> of reactions that people were getting. You know, some one guy was like getting really shaky and, you know, other guy just the, the, the dry, the cotton mouth and everything. And it's fascinating to watch. But, you know, I, I've, I've not competed for a little bit now, but I've competed several times over the years. And it definitely gets easier, I think, in time. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think <laughs> uh, my son, if one thing has done for him, because my son is a pro wrestler now. He, he wrestles and we did international stuff. But at the age of, I would say he was five when I was competing in Brazil. Now, t- uh, jiu-jitsu in Brazil is just like attending a soccer match. It's just the way it, 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 it was the most intimidating feeling for me. And, and I was doing Muay Thai prior to that. And I've competed in it. But just being in that bullpen... And all these Brazilians are like in separate teams screaming, cheering, like 5,000 of them for a jiu-jitsu tournament. So my son was competing at the same day. And it was that what it did to him is just he walks in in a whole ballroom, whatever. He's booked in with full of people that was just so like I said, competition helps with that. It, it gives that relax. And it's like, OK, we're about to do this. There's nothing else like it. It's hard to explain to anyone that's not competed what it actually feels like. Mm-hmm. Like I played football for years, and mm-hmm. playing uh, playing football compared to competing, I, I could I could run on a football match. Sometimes you get butterflies if it was a big game or you know pressure or whatever, but it's not the same as actually going out, stepping out, and like you said, fighting someone. Whether it is a grapple or whatever, you like you said, you still Absolutely. got there's still a real chance that someone could break your arm, someone could break break your knee, break your leg, you know, yeah. do do something that's going to really fuck you up. So, 
Yeah, and then it's and then you put on top of that the people watching. You know what I mean? The expectations and the expectations you put on yourself. It just all mounts in, and then it's like one big adrenaline dump, like you said. I remember when I first competed last year. I was like, oh, I'll be fine, fine. Didn't warm up properly. Went on the mats. I was like, oh, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. Fucking a, a one on points, the shittest fight I've ever done, really. And I, I, I was saying to him, I'll be fine. And I come off and I just went, my fucking hands, like the grip. I, I, couldn't, even, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't even squeeze my fists together. And he yeah. went, I told you. And I went, I oh, know, mate. I oh, know. <laughs> it's so oh, funny. Yeah, it, it? it was, I, I did. <laughs> It's crazy. I mean, I, I got to tell people, it's like my forehead is a roadmap of how many cuts and elbows I've took back. But I walked in my first jiu-jitsu tournament. I was an embarrassment. I was like, man, why, why was I there? It was, it was terrible. Thank God there was no footage out back then. It was just like, it's crazy. It's like I, I competed. We're going in for a fight, fight. This, this tournament shot my nerves down, shot my nerves up. It was, it's insane. Yeah. It's very weird. Feeling, so, right? Like I said, a competition is good for people to experience that. Uh, I think it's good for your character as well. I think it's good for people's character. You could see, mm -hmm. you know, oh, everyone yeah. yesterday Absolutely. shitting themselves. And then afterwards you can see it's like, oh, it's done now. And you do, you reflect on it and you think, I'm glad I've done that. At the time, you think, why the fuck am I doing this? Why am I putting myself through this? Why am I doing it? Blah, blah, blah. And once you've done it, and then even if you get a good or a bad result, you think, I'm glad I've done that. Because if you win, you think, great, that's, that was a good win. If you lose, you think, oh, I've got to work on this. You know, mm -hmm. I've got these things to work on. You know, I won't get caught with that choke again, or I won't get caught with this. Yeah, it's very true. And uh, going back to the, um, you know, your comments earlier for us about, obviously, in a real situation, there's lots of, you know, sort of emotion, lots of sort of bad language, and there's an escalation, isn't there, before it actually becomes physical normally. And I've found from a self-defense perspective over the years that I've managed to avoid many situations because of my ability to stay cool despite someone else being, getting quite aggressive and, you know, not not feeling the need to kind of match that and, and kind of peacock in a way to, to scare them off. And I found that sort of jujitsu and competing and, and having experienced that level of intensity and having that reassurance that I can handle it physically allows me to kind of stay calm in, in situations where maybe other people, if they were to react and match that energy from somebody, it would then escalate into violence, whereas, you know, the situations for me didn't. So I think that's another thing that you take from competing as well. I would 100% agree with you there. And also, I know my combative... Uh colleagues the combative people are always up and wind up i don't know why there's a there's a weird feeling they get like we are the way i mean jiu -jitsu had that too but uh, combatives i mean just to get it to them uh, i think that's just so people have a weird humor about everything that when you read a comment like that from a jitsu guy you're like eh. <laughs> but combatives <laughs> guys got venom in it it's just you know, like, ah, you know? so uh, one thing like i said i agree 100 percent what you're saying and that's what jiu -jitsu does more than any martial art out there, I will say this, it puts a level of calmness that you can look at something and assess you like, okay, should I freak out or should we just analyze more what's going on here? <laughs> so because of the, I mean, think about it, the situation it puts us in. You're on the ground and you got somebody on top of you and you can't do nothing. And sweating on top of you, it could be a chest right in your face, you can't look. So you're going to start figuring out which way I want to go to get him off me. And when you're teaching in self-defense, go, 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 go all the time. So what does the body do when it got confronted? Boom, explode. So see the balance. That's what I, I truly believe. But the, the benefits uh, when it comes to, like I said, it's just it can be a level of calm and kind of look at the situation and assess. Just, just assess that. And there's a lot of proven things out there about it. Some are even workforce and everything. Yeah, and, and I think another thing we talked about before as well, which would be interesting in your perspective on, is is you know we compare it to I don't know that like boxing, you know, arguably is you know from a, a striking perspective, you know, kind of right up there, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I've I'd still probably take Muay Thai if I had to choose, but mm -hmm. there's still good boxing in Muay Thai, so it's you know it's Absolutely. still the same point. And you know, you can spar relatively hard, but not full tilt because you'll just hurt your opponent. You'll knock each other out. You'll, you'll have CTE within a matter of years. <laughs> so, you know, you have to, you, 
there's a, there's a limit to, to, to the amount of intensity that you can put into the training and the sparring where jujitsu, again, providing you go a little bit easier on that, that sort of that finishing technique, you know, and, and maybe as we get older, you have to undulate this a little bit, but you can definitely train and spar at very high intensity. And, and I feel that's, that's one of the key factors as well when you sort of compare it to maybe striking arts, which also put you in very, you know, sort of difficult situations. But jiu-jitsu, because of the level of intensity that you can work at, seems to just be a bit more effective. Would you agree? Yes. Uh, I'll be honest with you here. When it comes to self-defense, so here's what I tell you. Let's say if we get a, a jiu-jitsu student, ask us, watches this podcast, for instance. It's like, I'm a jiu-jitsu student. I love jiu-jitsu. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Okay, fine. But I'm not learning self-defense. My advice here, and and I will, again, I'm harsh on Krav Maga because I've been in this industry for so long, that sometimes a jiu-jitsu student was like, I want to go to the crowd place, but they beat on me. Or, they, you know, there's an ego class sometimes. If that's the issue, and maybe you, can find, you didn't find a good Krav Maga place that teaches, like, seriously combatives, they're just doing, you know, scenarios. Anyway, if a jiu-jitsu person with jiu-jitsu, and let's say they learn Muay Thai or boxing, they're okay to defend themselves. But other than they need to learn, it would be a good book if they get a book about something about awareness coming in from somebody in an industry like combatives, bodyguard, have been in security before. These kind of things are very important. And maybe take a class or two in weapon disarms somebody pulled a firearm so none of those weapon disarms are guaranteed to save your life so let's just put this out there but it's good to know something than just to go into total freezing now it doesn't mean i show you how to disarm a firearm gun that's 100 percent proof no that just goes off as soon as you touch it the knife you can get it tangles falls goes so but there's a this is there's a stupid philosophy out there that they feel if I teach these techniques, it works. No, these are possibilities. But it's good to know something to react and deal with it than just sit there and just get gutted. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's an interesting dilemma, isn't it? I don't know if you've seen this, Raz. There, there's a, uh, on YouTube, there's a, uh, like a series called the Self-Defense World Championships. Um, it was run by a guy called Rokas, who was, I think, I think he was a Krav Maga guy who went on a journey of discovery with martial arts and oh. started learning jiu-jitsu and ended up doing MMA. I'm pretty sure he was a Krav guy. No, he was an Aikido guy, actually. Apologies. Okay. He was an Aikido guy. Are you familiar with the with this with this show? Have you seen it? No, I'm not, to be honest. That kind of sounds intriguing. Yeah, I'll send you the link. But they um they they put these, they they got a, a, a different martial arts. They had an MMA guy, a jiu-jitsu guy, uh, I think a karate guy, uh, and some self-defense practitioners and took them off in, into Europe somewhere and created these insane scenarios. They had them fighting on a, a moving bus. Um, you know, they had them sort of doing uh evading kind of intruders and, and trying mm -hmm. to escape and and then also had them fighting, you know, sort of in knife fights and Mate, that one was fucking hilarious. He showed me that one where he was stabbing him and how many times? How many times was it? Like 42 times or whatever it was? Like, So they did a couple of scenarios where someone would pull a knife and they were like, defend yourself. And a couple of the guys got into a bit of a ruckus and got themselves, it was basically a, a marker pen. Mm. Um, so they, they got themselves stabbed. A couple of the, 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 the self-defense trained guys did the right thing and gave their wallet and cooperated and were fine. But they also put them in a scenario where they actually had to fight somebody who was attacking them with a knife. And nobody survived. And like Danny just said, I think once they got sort of physical with somebody with a knife, I think that on average they got stabbed about 30 times. It was insane to watch. I, my first, in, <laughs> I don't know if I want to call it interaction with a knife. When I was a teenager, I was a young Muay Thai kid back in Saudi Arabia. And I was in downtown Air Jeddah. And... This, I think, Somali guy came up, and I remember it all. He came up right in front of me, said something. I was like, What? and went this way. My reaction just being worse, like I kicked him immediately back, and I heard something drop. My brother at the time, he was like, He was pointing at me, he's like, Fraz, you're bleeding, and I got cut right under him. Luckily, it wasn't anything penetrated, it was just a cut. It was just like that. Now, my reaction was to my training, I just kicked him hard back. And then I've dropped. And, of course, we ran away. And, you know, I had to go to the hospital and get that all done. 
But I would say if and people spoke against me about this and another mentor of mine named Kelly McCann said this as well. If you got away from a knife fight and scratched, that's not technique. That's just luck and God with you. <laughs> <laughs> you just got out. I mean, once it gets confrontational, there's a blade involved. It's, it's, it's messy. It's messy. Yeah. I mean, we teach people, yeah, there are certain things, how to grab the arm to make sure instead of you grabbing the blood. I get it. There are certain things we cover to hope if in that situation. But uh, there's no guarantee. No, and, and this is the thing. And, um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I observed a lot when they were doing this exercise is that they would grab the, the, the knife arm and the assailant would just reach over and take the knife out. <laughs> it, was, it was happening a lot. Yeah, and, yeah, swap hands. Yeah, and the other thing, of course, is is in addition to having the knife, the, 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 the attacker in this scenario was also allowed to hit them and grab them as well. Oh, so, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, yeah, it was... They're it was just standing there pointing the knife at you. Yeah, they're not just waving the knife. They're yeah. actually punching and, and stabbing yeah. as well. But now, 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 here's one thing I would like to say. Now, as even in jiu-jitsu, pulling off an armbar in training is way different than rolling, way different than tournaments. We agree, right? Yeah. So it's the same when we train students and you see somebody holding. Now, is that realistic? Hell no. Fuck no. That's not realistic. But if we want to go over certain how to go after the arm here, here. Now, when you start shooting into the drill of realistic, somebody coming down with speed spiking or get, going in, just, just sawing in you, you'll see a lot of shit fly out the window. But you also see the students were going away attacking it different than how they deal with it. What I do to my students, let's say I got a, if I'm doing a knife to sound workshop or a class. If they never did any disarms or any defense, I just let first like, all right, get the knife, go at it. What? Go at it. And you'll see it, you're trying to grab it with their hand and everyone, I'm sleeping. You got stabbed. You got stabbed. And I'm counting the whole time. Now when you train, you notice, yes, they will get hit once, twice. They understand it happens. What I, my point is don't sit there and go, oh, my God, and keep getting stabbed. But you see them now going, trying to really how to stop that arm or just hit certain places even to escape better than just like, you know, hands everywhere and they're just getting pounded. So, yes, there are certain things. I think there are steps to it, to everything. If somebody can break it down, but also be honest with the student at the end. Avoid the situation if you can. No, it's, it's good. It's, it's good advice, mate. I think this is probably the... The biggest danger isn't it with self-defense where techniques are being taught you know sort of maybe in isolation so here's uh -huh. a knife this is how you you know defend against it here's how you disarm somebody without all that stuff that you just talked about uh -huh. and you know the the danger of course of that is you give people a false sense of security that they can handle a certain scenario and maybe even put themselves in it despite you know being completely out of it so so yeah, hopefully people listen to your words there and take that away, mate, because it's very important, I think. Yeah, I will tell you something I've done for science, I call. So when I was uh, training the uh, the MP battalions down at Fort Leavenworth, I was combative instructor for that, that day. And the colonel at that time, they were doing firing range stuff, okay? So I looked and I saw them using the ARs. I remember... You know, and I see self-defense books when I was reading, even going through combatives training and all that. You know, this is how you grab the AR, this is how you put like the muzzle. And I was wondering, and I have no experience with guns. Uh, you know, to me now, yes, I know how to shoot a gun, I teach people how to disarm it, but I'm not one of those that you see me got 50 <laughs> cannons behind me. <laughs> not against it, but just say either way. So I told the car, I was like, I'm going to do something, it's going to be stupid. And he just looked at me and it was like, fuck, you're going to be doing this out. I was like, there's a method to my madness. So after they were fighting there, I went and I grabbed the muzzle. Well, guess what happened to my hand? <laughs> Sizzle like bacon. <laughs> and he was like, and he was like, the fuck you were doing that for? I was like, well, have you looked at the combatives books we got roaming around here? And it was like, not really. I go to a page where it shows, it says somebody fires an axe, he grabbed the muzzle and hit back. I was like, are they saying it with gloves or did they say it before or after they fired? Because you guys just shot around and here look what happened in my hand. And everybody looked at it like, shit. 
<laughs> and I said, I came from the Middle East. We don't touch firearms. It's illegal. So when I saw this going on, I'm looking at books I'm like, oh, let me check this out. So again, going to realistic point of views of things, where are we going? Yeah, it's the same in the UK as well. We we don't have, really have guns over yeah. here. I mean, they, they they occasionally turn up, but um, very rarely. So it's it's so basically knife crime, isn't it? Yeah, the UK. It's uh, you know certainly London and and um, you know a few other cities. There's a there's a real knife problem in the UK. Mm. Um, you know, and a lot of that that's that's a that's a bigger that's a bigger issue probably beyond just the actual tool that they're using. But yeah, and one thing that we've we've discussed a couple of times as well in regard to i guess law enforcement and both in the us and the uk is it's it, you know it's it's the police and and their sometimes their, their inability to restrain people you know correctly i mean what are your thoughts on on the use of like choke holds and that type of thing for for law enforcement now first of all i thought the uk's are better than us i lived there i was there for two years in brighton i think in england when i lived there oh yeah but uh Wow, I thought you guys' training might be better than us here. I don't know you guys going through the same thing. Yeah, do you know, again, going back to the, the chat we had on, it was the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu guy locally. He was an ex-police officer. Um, and and he, yeah, he, he said the, the training was terrible. Um, and and that was partly, well, that was primarily why he got himself involved with, with Jiu-Jitsu was mm -hmm. because he felt mm -hmm. so insecure as a police officer because of the training. There's a couple of scenarios he was in and he said uh, he felt really uncomfortable with. Yeah. And he felt like it, it could have really went the wrong way. He didn't go into detail, but he said it could have really went the wrong way. Um, and I think some of it did. And yeah, that's why he got into Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. So so I, so I secondhand information, and it may be better now because I think this was um, going back sort of maybe 10, 15 years for the guy. But yeah, I think there's there's still occasionally like with you guys. I mean, you've obviously had the bigger cases of it, um, where obviously people have, have sadly died, and it's um, been very unfortunate. We've we've not had that from recollection, but we certainly see plenty of footage knocking around on social media these days where police are just making fools of themselves trying to restrain people. It is a necessity, to be honest with you, and 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 it's crazy because in the military they treat them also jujitsu combatives with the other combatives they got. So if we're training this to the military, why are we not doing it to our police? And if, of course, people's like, why are you encouraging them to kill civilians? I was like, I didn't say that. <laughs> it's just use your brains for once. But absolutely, it's a joke. I mean, even the unfortunate uh, situations with charcoal. Charcoals are not a bad thing. We know when to put it on, when to let go. But you, these guys, of course, they kill somebody with an arm bar, shower coat, whatever. They put like a, it's almost like trying to rapture somebody's throat. Yeah, they don't know how to do it. And in my, I will be honest with you, Paul, in my past from working as a doorsman and a bodyguard, I have not punched one, once in anybody in the face. Not once I have punched. My knuckles, I've only used them in my Muay Thai fights and with a lot of padding and all that. I've never. Maybe I smack one or a few to get them in position. Everything I've done is just press all them and throw them. Either throw them on their head, put them on the floor, put them in a chokehold and get them out. I've not once punched. Kicks, yes, to help every now and then to move a leg or something or kick down behind the leg, take them down. But never. Didn't drop elbows, didn't punch anything when I was on those uh, jobs. And I'm not saying it's, oh, because I got it, it's easy. It's always a struggle when you start getting hands in, and especially what cocktails they're infused on, you know? And uh, even when I worked at uh, the, uh, the mental wards, from just dealing with sick patients to the criminally ill as well, mentally ill. We are, we're not supposed to beat on them. They're sick. You know, they're mentally stable. But there's ways to hold them. And you'd be surprised. Some of them are some medications. It's just like dealing with the Frankenstein. You're like, okay, he's not going down. <laughs> Somebody needs to hold him and get, get the needle and just to put him out. <laughs> so, but uh, I agree absolutely. It, it, I believe police should be at blue level, blue belt level. To be out in the street. Now, people think I'm crazy to take serious. I was like, no, if you take the, the simplicity of the combative way, how they do it for cops, I mean, what the grace combative do, absolutely. Just a blue belt level. They don't need to yeah, be could, purple, could, brown belts, or uh, black belts, purple belts, just to deal with that. But uh, this is the mess we're in. And, it, and we, I will tell you the truth, I live here in downtown Kansas City. I had my business for 10 years. How many law enforcement officers do you think I'm tra I train? I feel like you're not, not going to say very many. 
<laughs> for over the 10 years, maybe four. Yeah, is that it? it you, yeah. I guess in the they are I guess to the academy. I guess in the US, because I guess in the US, they've obviously got the firearms, haven't they, the police, where in the UK, we don't have that. So if there is a difference in the the sort of ability to you know restrain then it's probably something to do with that i mean we've got tasers and 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 spray and everything else but obviously the firearm do you think that gives the police like a false level of confidence or not a false level of confidence they've still got the firearm by level of confidence do you think it's because of the firearms that they're, they're not interested in in doing it's good it's good you put that point out you know i totally forgot even the police in the uk don't use firearms even though you know i've lived there and, and worked there i just remember right now um thinking about it i think you're correct I think you're correct. They think, I mean, obviously, we've seen how many people they've shot that shouldn't be shot. And, you know, and, and again, we are a very violent society. I don't care what they want to say about America. We are in the violence level of ever. I live in this city in the Midwest. We never had this crazy crime. Now we're, we're they, they label us killer city. Killer city. We just had a shootout that when they were uh, celebrating the Super Bowl for the Chiefs. It was on the news all the way to everywhere in the world. Every day they're shooting, every day there's violent crimes. So, yeah, and these people don't train. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with Tom DeBloss. He's a good friend of mine. And you see him daily posting. And people think he's making fun of law enforcement. He's like, no, I'm calling them out. This is embarrassing. This this is a scene. Especially when you crazy see as well. Tom's, oh, my God. Tom's, Tom's Instagram channel keeps getting like muted like he's like getting no reach other than his followers like it's ridiculous all he's doing is highlighting like real scenarios a lot of it he's like cutting bits out so it's not like nothing bad but because he's putting it on he he gets censored all the time and i think it's fucking crazy you can you can you can do whatever you want you can you censor stuff that is actually important it needs to be addressed and it's like no you can't can't Mm -hmm. say that Mm -hmm. can't say that it's fucking weird i just don't understand it he went, uh, one day we were talking, I'm like, is he posting? And then I was like, oh, he keeps getting censored. <laughs> he got to go on phone, absolutely. Yeah, you actually got to like, uh, like I follow him and, and I've actually got to click on his profile now because his reels and his, his content doesn't show on my Instagram. Doesn't show. And and I, I don't fo- follow a massive amount of people. And yeah, literally I have to, I even was checking to see if I was still following him because his, his mm-hmm. stuff wasn't coming up. And then, it, yeah, it was all there. And I was like, yeah, he's just fucking... He's just I, I was a victim of it for three years from 2020, 2023. You can tell why, because it was the time of the whole close downs and everything. And the city mayor didn't like me. And they targeted me to harm my business big time, you know? Now I'm on the clear. My numbers grew up. And I was like, oh, so this is real. Okay. It's <laughs> <laughs> crazy. So it? it is. But if you can watch the videos, you see this cops, three cops beating on a person with a baton and he still didn't go down. Now, one thing I've learned, there's a good uh, friend of mine, his name uh, Samuel Brill. Um, he's a um, Filipino martial artist, very good. He's originally from Israel. He's a brother, a great friend of mine. And he also addresses the Filipino training with combative ways, get to the point. And I love using a lot of the sticks. And I'm watching, I have built, and even with my friend when we talk, a whole curriculum teach cops how to use the baton. Not the way they're using it by beating. Literally, that weapon can be the best weapon. You can just hold somebody together. And no, nope, six of them are beating the hell. I'm like, man, with those batons and this guy's still not down, it just takes one takedown and put him down or kind of rock him up. Like, what are you guys doing? It should just so, be mandatory. It should be mandatory. It should be every, like you said, like, yeah. I don't understand why the military have to do, well, not have to, but they treat, teach a lot of military jujitsu. We got a lad from our gym, Chris, he's just been out in the US with the Marines. He, I think he, he met the, all the Marines over there and they just had a big tournament and it was really cool. And he went around New York and they do that all the time. They do, you know, military competitions and they do all the, the police don't do any of it. No. So they probably need it more than the fucking, uh, the soldiers. Absolutely. <laughs> I never knew when I was teaching tra- uh, teaching combatives at Fort Leavenworth, one day they were like with us, uh, the colonel, he's a big fight fan. He's, one, he's just a giant. And I, I, I like that colonel because he used to get down and train with us too. But uh, it's like you're coming for the fights and I thought they got a UFC fight guy there. No, it's just like you said, they got the team together and they're going at it. And like you said, it, 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 they still try their skills. And if you think about the MPs, this is the military police 
and the prisoners are there are ex-military. So they're dealing with a, a trained person as well. So they got to get their, you know, their shit straight. But yep, the cops here are on the street all the time. They don't have any training. They don't look in any physical shape to be handling anything. And I'm not saying they should all look intimidating, but yeah, they should look like when I look at them, like I think twice I'm not doing anything, you know? But uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that appearance does make a difference. It really does. I remember when I was younger and my teenage years, I grew up in quite a deprived area in the UK. And there was uh, there was like a block of flats called the Bull Ring. And it was notorious for, for you know, wrong and, and crime. And I was in there one, one afternoon and there was something going off uh, with some of the residents. And uh, I think because the local police knew knew the area and knew this particular building, the police were called and these two police officers turned up and they were two of the biggest men I've ever seen. They're both, <laughs> both like probably at least six, four, like that could barely fit down the corridor. And the moment they showed up, obviously unarmed, obviously the UK police and no firearms, but the moment they showed up, everybody just settled down because nobody fancied getting into a tussle with those two. So it, it, that, that presence does make a real difference, I think. To, Absolutely. To when uh, me and my brother were on our last tour the end of high school, I just maybe entered college um, down here in Kansas City. Um, we were staying with our mom because my dad was overseas a lot at that time. And the, the officer of the neighborhood, his name is Steve Burden. Now, me and my brother used to call him Big Boss Man because he we related him to the wrestler back in the day. WWE. He was just he was six foot seven and has the deepest voice. And he would come every now and then to sit with my mom for coffee. And then we will mess around and mom would call him. Well, anytime we see Steve at the door, and and he was like, Is your mom there? You're like, Oh, uh, yeah. And we're like thinking, oh <laughs> shit, what did we do? <laughs> 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 so, oh yeah, that town, that little city was safe. When anytime you see him driving down, man, or just walking, or just walking, and he was just a big person, kind of loving, but I never see people completely bullshit him. <laughs> see, the thing is, though, I don't think the the police force these days attracts that type of person anymore into that job because it's gone uh, so agree. left, so the yes. other way that yes, someone like that. I got to my final interview the police only like eighteen months ago. And I just decided not to go in because I just don't think that fucking my personality would suit it. You know, mm -hmm. I think I'd probably end up in more trouble than I would, you know, actually doing the job. And I think I'd be a good police officer, but you got to be so careful with everything you say, everything yes. you do. There's cameras everywhere. You know, even like you said, you got you 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 step wrong in one direction and you're over. You're not just you're not just fired. You're prosecuted. You could be in prison. You know. So yeah, I, I think. I think that's where they've got to draw a line with this shit because people are end people are ending up in worse positions. Like a public are ending ending up in a worse position because of how society's going. Well, the way it's going so left and so soft. Because, no. like you said before, violence is violence. These people that are violent and are bad, they're, they're never going to stop. So then, if everyone's really, really soft and we haven't got the, I don't know, the things in in place to stop it then they're all fucked, didn't we? I absolutely agree with you. I even, 100, it's just when you think about it, the way they're all muzzled, I mean, when you see them all dancing and TikTok and all that and doing this kind of crap. Now, when I was overseas, um, I'm originally Saudi Arabian as well because that's where my family's from. So when I go down and overseas, now the cops, of course, the physical body built of a Middle Eastern is different than the Western. You don't get them as big, you know. But I'll tell you, um, they're very great professional. Of course, not with the new regime and the leadership of the new, you know, prince and all that down there. It's different. But I, will, I have crossed path with a few officers just to go discuss certain things. And I see that look on their face when they saw something going on there and how it addressed. I tell you. At age of 46, that gave me flashbacks of a kid. I almost shit my pants just standing by him while he's talking to that kid. I'm like, oh, man, he's in trouble. It, 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 so even though I'm, I was bigger than him, but I tell you, his authority level just switched that fast when he said, hey, you, here. I'm like, whoa. And he said, the the was like, oh, I'm sorry. And it's yeah. almost they are doing what back in the day. They're enforcing safety in neighborhoods. I mean, they see somebody that doesn't have to be a ticket, doesn't have to be a jail, but it's like, Quit that shit. I mean, literally, that's the look he gave him. Like, quit that shit. And it worked. <laughs> <laughs> it 
and just yeah, go to back what Danny said. Right, yeah, Who can I take these guys right. are serious? They're argumentative. They're a bunch of men that just sit and argue like a bunch of women. Are you going to go argue with a violent person? I'll say, mate. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I think I think you're completely right. I think I think the Western world now. I think it's not now, even now. Imagine in like thirty years. That's what I think. Like countries, they talk about countries like you know Russia and 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 Saudi and all these sorts of places where they still have like a real. Uh, it's, it's still really disciplined. Yes, but we're going so far the other way that in a minute, like Shockingly. countries, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, countries like Russia who have still, you know, imagine like if we didn't have our nuclear arms and things like that. If Russia invaded the UK like they've invaded Ukraine, we would bend over and let them mm -hmm. tickle our bellies. We would be Same fucked. We would be absolutely fucked, right? And there's no two ways about it. We would be fucked, but. Because of uh, the way Ukraine's run and the way that Poland is, and you know those Eastern European countries are still quite quite right, quite manly. It's all you know, it's still quite traditional. That's that all that stuff's in place because they have to be because they know that they've got countries around them that are still like <laughs> they haven't got that backing that we've got where we're like, oh yeah, they won't touch us because we'll just nuke them or we're just you know we we've got we got this or we got that. To Danny, I agree. <laughs> you know. There's no arguments on my side from what you're saying, 100%. Now, here's what, what's shocking with me, gentlemen. So when people ask me, oh, how you guys are so advanced, blah, 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 when I go to Saudi and come back, I was like, can I tell you something that drives you crazy? He's like, what? He's like, do you understand my generation, especially they're calling us to come back? You know, all of us that run the country, the new generation of my generation, the younger ones, and the government are all UK and United States and Germany educated. So how are we able to learn from you guys and come back and do well with our country and these countries are not able to do? That's what I told them. I was like, sit back. I had a surgeon that rescued me back in Saudi Arabia from a botched uh, procedure here. Okay, so I'm going through a lot of things. The surgeon in Saudi is an American and Canadian board. How is he able to give me better medicine then the guy in America here that is educated for supposedly the same. You see where I'm getting at? And I said, that's what some people say. They're not doing miracles. Oh, they got money. I was like, no. Money is there because there's also work to be done. But they're learning from you and going back and put it together. So we got the tools in the West that other third world countries are becoming progressive countries. <laughs> But we fucked off. And, and, you know, I, I've been here most of my life. I was born here in the States. And I tell them, even when I go back, I was like, I see what these people are doing. What We got soft, as his daddy said, too comfortable. And just think, you know, when I'm just, I'm going to shoot that text or whatever post on social media, it solves the problem and how I feel about you. And here we go. And uh, Absolutely. It's, it's 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 sad, and even it's translating in martial arts. You see them. I see all these keyboard words like man. Pretty sure you're a white belt that didn't do much, and you're just sitting here talking <laughs> and uh, and making fun of this black belt that just did a technique that maybe didn't impress you. Yeah, it's a mad world, isn't it? Fraz, where did you? Um, so you said obviously you were born in the U.S. and you yes. spent time obviously in Saudi. Where did you first sort of pick up martial arts, and, and which discipline was it that you started with? I picked that up at the age of eight, actually, in Saudi Arabia. Now, in Saudi at that time, you, when you get registered for school, you pick a ball sport. Well, actually, they pick a field. I'm not tall, so they throw my ass in soccer. It's like, there's no way I'm going to be basketball or volleyball. <laughs> and then you pick a martial art. So they got karate, taekwondo, aikido, or judo. Now, I looked at that time and asked what Judah is. I was like, you throw people. I was like, all right, that. And <laughs> that's how I started. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's in our schooling program. Wow. You get to learn martial art. Yeah, it's in the that's curriculum really cool, of the school. They martial should do art, that yeah. everywhere. That would be amazing. That would be amazing, yeah. wouldn't it, if they'd done it everywhere? My master at Sensei at that time, his dojo was in the school. So it had two doors, one that opens from the schoolyard to go in, and then when the, uh, the school is closed during, you know, at the evening, that other old door opens for the public students to come in. He was in the school. He had more authority and power over us than our own principal. I never got my black belt in judo because I failed the math test 
he found out and he didn't want to test me. So I got mine. I was like, <laughs> F him. I'm not on care for my black. But, you know, I was young, dumb, and full of cum. <laughs> now I regret it. You know, he passed away. And everybody tell me, why don't you get your black? But I was like, no, that's a lesson learned in uh, ego. And I want to keep that to remind me. Yeah, but that's brilliant, isn't it, as well? And, and you know, we don't have, um, you know, we, we've got, a, a, again, probably like the US, we've got a childhood obesity problem here in the UK. Oh, and, yeah. you know, Danny and I have both got but got young boys, Jack's 11? 11, yeah, 12 yeah. next month. Yeah, my lad's uh, four, four and a half. And, you know, my, my boy's already doing taekwondo, already doing a bit of judo and jujitsu. Danny's lads now uh, just played a bit of sort of ball sports, but getting more into jujitsu now. Love his MMA. Yeah. Love his MMA but classes. But I think in, unless you're like a parent who is maybe passionate about that and you put your kids into it, they're just, it's just not that encouraged yeah. in schools. But I think that's great that they put you in. And also that there is a, you know, some some degree of, of I guess, accountability from like an academic perspective as well. Mm-hmm. So there's a link, there's an alignment. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and for, and for some students, unlike yourself, that might have, you know, that might have, you know, sort of encourage them to do better in the classroom, perhaps, and, you know, to, to get the black belt or whatever belt they were chasing. So I think that's great. And and how long do you kind of practice that for? I mean, you said, is it mandatory, you say, or is it just an optional thing? No, it's mandatory. It Martial arts in school, yeah. How long? The whole um, through time all your school year. So I went from, <laughs> you know, I was in the same school till I graduated. And in 1995, I moved in the United States okay. um, here. They had, I had to do a year of the high school year because some of the credits didn't transfer or something before I went into college. And, of course, I picked up on wrestling from here in the States, uh, in the school. I was like, what is this wrestling thing? You know, I know a different wrestling. So we got into that. And then, you know, picked up. Uh, I also did Muay Thai. Uh, it was overseas. But that, that between the dude and Muay Thai, I got involved more in MMA here. It was something new to me i never seen before. And from that, how I transitioned into um, a jiu-jitsu. But in Krav, I got into it because when I first moved here, I met a guy and wanted to have a grappling or striking coach to work at his academy. And I was like, okay, and he's a Krav guy. And I hear about Krav, but, you know, when he come out as a fighter background, it's like, yeah, fuck with this shit. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> so then he told me about it. Listen. Boss Rutan is doing a seminar. And I'm a big fan of Boss Rutan. It's one of my idols. And Boss at that seminar was endorsing Krav Maga. He was doing some work with Krav Maga worldwide. And I went in and it was that seminar when I attended and watched Boss breaking it down that struck with me. I was like, you know what? This stuff is easy. I know how to do this shit. But there's something to it that the others don't cover. And that's how I got into it. And it was from there. And then I seeked, uh, um, got certified by uh, very um, uh, great instructors. One of them is uh, James Hiromasa. He runs Colorado Krav Maga. Him and his wife, uh, Shannon, uh, they're one of the first when we went through the courses and they see me. And every, all the Krav guys were challenging me. For some reason, I don't understand. I, I would never. You guys gotta love this. For by the way, if you, you want a, a badge for jujitsu, so there came a point where you have to spar, okay, or grapple. And here I am, tired. They've been beating on me all day, and I know they're focused on me. Now sometimes they focus on you because they see something in you. Because you know the hair muscle saw it. There's like you're very charismatic. You're a great speaker. You, you're gonna be a good coach. I said, well, I've been teaching, but not this. So anyway. Come in one of their first, second degree, whatever, fuck with for black belt and crop. I took his back. This fella hammer fisted my groin maybe 15 times. <laughs> and I was getting irritated. Yeah, it hurt. It sucks, you know? Like he was, you know, sweaty and wobbly. So he goes and boom, boom. Um, so I got pissed. I choke him up, put him to sleep. <laughs> the dumb, the people are running that. Instead of saying, oh, shit, hitting the groins doesn't work when somebody got your back. So instead of them saying that, they said, I'm unsafe. I should not even be teaching. I was like, <laughs> he was hitting my balls for a good minute. <laughs> and I put him out to sleep. He's choked out. <laughs> yeah, and, he, and he's okay. And I am the unsafe? Nobody told me there was striking involved. 
If there was striking involved, I would have slapped them and put them in the choke real fast. So other instructors are involved that said, nah, he cool. We're going to keep him. But so that, that showed me right there what I saw immediately. And that was way back then. That was in the crowd. My God, rise, you know. I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of holes here. And these people are very insecure when it comes to the ground. So I kind of kept quiet. I was just coming up the ranks, you know. And just sitting observing because I felt I was a target. And I never said. But to be honest, we have a habit as jiu-jitsu people that when we see something doesn't work, we give an opinion. But we're not being dick about it. But you do it there, they're like, fuck you think you know. I'm a Krav Maga, six degree, red belt, whatever. I'm like, okay. I was just saying that's not going to stop a rear naked choke if you pull my finger. (laughs) 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 It's not going to work. I'm going to choke you out. I was just so, going to ask, how many bouts are there? How many bouts are there in Krav Maga? Because is it is it? It is really, it, is it really, it quick really depends. Too? It depends. See, I make my system follow the jiu-jitsu way. Um, with the levels, I stick to that same call. I only added maybe like the, there's a green level in there because that's I want to focus on the ground while on mine. But in my system, I follow that. Now, their system, you see them, they do orange, green. I mean, just you have to understand, mate. Some of the Krav Maga background has some tiki di karate element to it. So some of the ways, you know, because some of them have that background. Now, not this in all of them. That's a whole different thing I don't want to get into <laughs> right like, now. Yeah. Uh, so, so weird. But uh, it, it has some of that. I'm kind of, I follow the jiu-jitsu route with a lot of other things I've done. And it's just, you know, of course, and Krav doesn't take 15 years like jiu-jitsu to master. You know, if somebody, I would say this, if you do jiu-jitsu and you got good striking, you can go through their module in that, I would say, year or two. Then the different person, you take some of the regular person that never done anything will be five years. In my suggestion, so really to be doing, because I put them through everything. I even got an MMA gym. I send them to train Muay Thai there. Yeah, are not going to be black rank with me because you're going to smile. You have to learn what, how it feels. You have to eat it. And it, unfortunately, not a lot of people do that. And that's when the fight happens. That goes. One, one thing I've always liked about um, well, MMA originally, but jiu-jitsu's definitely gone this way now, is I remember when I um, was doing Muay Thai and uh, I brought a friend in who was, uh, I think, a Taekwondo guy at the time, and we were sparring, and he threw some sort of like jumping Taekwondo kick. Um, and it, was, it, it, it worked. And it, he hit me with it, and it bloody hurt. And the coach... <laughs> the, but the coach was like, you can't throw that kick, this is Muay Thai. And in that moment, I can remember thinking, mm-hmm. well, that's dumb because it worked. And we're, we're doing Muay Thai and it still worked. So why yeah. can't you just add in whatever techniques are effective? And then around that time, MMA was, you know, sort of the UFC was starting to become more popular. And and yeah, obviously mixed martial arts is exactly that, isn't it? Jiu-Jitsu these days is obviously, you know, rapidly changing, obviously with the introduction of the Mornoki and the, the leg lock systems everything else and Absolutely. it sounds like oh my god the leg locks are sorry no. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like it sounds like your style of Krav Maga you obviously incorporate Thai boxing or Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu yes. you know as, as like an art is it quite fluid and flexible and malleable like that or are, are, are traditionally Krav Maga instructors very strict and it's got to be done this way oh they're the worst I'm sorry for using the word. I I, 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 I call them combative Nazis. That's how they are. I I had to get out of any affiliation with them. I remember my jiu-jitsu master hit me in the back because I was complaining to him. Like I said, I've met combative-wise, there's a few people I like a lot and I respect. One of them is Kelly McCann. He's one of my mentors. And he is just blunt honest. He he has an MMA team, he has a jiu-jitsu team, and he has combatants. And he just doesn't like the horse shit. I think he's one of the godfathers of this. There's another guy named Hak Hakam have addressed this. And he's one of them. Um, like I said, Rich, uh, Dimitri is one. But like I say, to be honest, they're fair. I am one of – okay, let me put it this way. If you meet a crowd instructor with a jiu-jitsu background, they're the ones that be like, yeah, we can add that. If that can work or change. You see, they're very fluid. But you get combative guys that never done this come out. Oh no! Oh no! They are Jesus on water, and that's the issue. And like I said, and they have an intimidation. Like I've been with this guy to write an affiliation. 
mean, I've noticed like my growth and my popularity as it going and how I see things. I'm, I still respect them, man. I've learned a lot from you. You taught me. And I thought the goal, we make our students become better than us. I have students that sometimes I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to bring a gun the next time if I have to deal with him. You know, <laughs> like he's becoming that good. You see, but isn't that the point? But like, that's not what in want, though, isn't it? That's what I, I always say even with my clients. They hate this. They, if you, it, they, that's one thing I appreciate so much of jiu-jitsu did to me. That's why I call myself a jiu-jitsu guy more than I'm known to be a crowd guy. It's that mentality we're talking about, Paul. Like, it's just always, yeah, you know, it's not the end of the world. Oh, no. Not what the craft gods. Oh, you have done the forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it, it, that it is sucks. that's because money though as well like they, they're trying to run a school and i always feel with these these kind of not, not odd martial arts but martial arts where they're, they're very closed off i find they'll they'll just they'll fight against each other and then they'll they'll hype themselves up that they're the best um, mm -hmm. and then they create yeah, yeah, yeah. this cult cult like feeling um and then I always find, though, it's because they don't want people to compete. They don't want people to go out because they, they yeah. want them to just feed them full of fucking money. And they take, they take like, take advantage of vulnerable people who want to actually learn how to defend themselves because they've been bullied or they've been in bad situations. or And they're like the worst type of fucking people, isn't they? Because they're just basically taking advantage of people that are vulnerable. Uh, absolutely. I'll tell you, Dan, you would like this. So, of course, they're my younger. I'm at 46. Uh, one of my sisters, oh, my black belts harassed me. They say, oh, now you're like grandpa. You're like so nice. You're not yelling and making sure nobody gets hurt. I was like, well, you guys came in during my younger time. I was like toughing the fuck up. Right now, I was like, no, 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 don't do that. Take it easy. I know the face. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not saying I'm getting soft, but I do not want them to go walk around like me a day. You know, we, we get to know it. I mean, we've all been there. <laughs> so, anyway... My top tire black belts, as they're getting there in the system, so the sparring time comes. I said, we're going to do advanced classes, so let's start sparring. I, at that time, I had the three amateur fighters, and I actually did it pro, and I told the fighters, scale it way down, but go at it. My craft team that day, after that class, all of them kind of had, got demoralized. They're like, I just noticed all the training I've been doing just went out the window. I was like, well, hold on. I was like, you've been training, but you haven't been training for something coming up yet. This is why we're doing these classes. He's like, I couldn't do shit. I got punched like 50 times in the face and my hands are still up. I was like, mm-hmm. So I, I put students through sometimes that reality uh, check uh, of that. And it, I think it's, it's important. Like, I think it's really important. It, you have to, honestly. We all have it. Okay, haven't we... Uh, Whatever level we've been belts, I would say my purple belts was my challenge you want. That, you know, you're like, I'm a purple belt here. And here comes this blue belt that just busts all through you. And you're like, what just fucking happened here? <laughs> it takes you down a notch. <laughs> and I do believe all martial arts need that. And this is one thing I think, again, if people are there, it's like, man, this craft guy is a jiu-jitsu guy. I was going to say that. But again, going back to the old thing we said, what jiu-jitsu does, it's that. It, once it kills that ego and put that humbleness, in, and I do wish a lot of jiu-jitsu practitioners will continue with that humbleness because they need to also experience other arts as well. It should open up their mind. And like I said, I get along more with jiu-jitsu people more because, like I said, from my insurance, everybody does jiu-jitsu. Those are the guys I stick with, so we have a good mentality. But I also believe we have a bad set going on in jiu-jitsu that we think it is the way. Yes, it helps a lot. It's a very effective system. Don't get me wrong. But we also need to add certain balances if you want to call it self-defense. Just don't get the false sense of confidence. But just going back, you know, from what you guys do, you know, on your podcast and all that information outside. Now, it is not hard for a student to get information of the basic, most self Defense needed tip is awareness. You have everybody will do it. I mean, I'm in the future going to be uh, launching a site. Yes, we deal with technique, but also it's this part that nobody speaks of. So you add that and you add to the training of jujitsu and you add to some maybe hands on. Person could be fine. I mean, just like you say in the UK, I think there's the need to add somebody dealing with uh, a knife or a blade coming in. It doesn't need to be that complicated. But again, somebody needs to train and need to train something that is real. Not just waste your time. I mean, I watch with all the respect to anybody doing taekwondo or karate. I fuck, man. <laughs> I watch what they're doing. I uh, just look. I was like, man, 
And then I look how much they're paying them. I was like, why would you just to be able to get paid this way? <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. I bet Hollywood did a good job. Now, if we can have more jujitsu movies from Hollywood coming, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. And and Matt, I wanted to ask as well. Obviously, you've uh, you've done some body work, sort of uh, body bodyguarding work. You've, you've worked yes. indoors, you said as well. What what you, I feel like you must have been in several scenarios, and you've mentioned a couple already, or alluded to a couple where you've obviously had to defend yourself. I mean. Are there any kind of incidents that really stand out where you think, thank God I knew what I knew? Oh, uh, otherwise yes. Otherwise, I've been in a real predicament. I will tell, tell you this those. one. This one. Now, I'm not a big guy at all. So I'm not the guy you see in the door. I'm the one inside that's just scanning for what's going to be happening. You know, you need to put the big and strong and ugly up there. Even doesn't have shit technique. It's just big. <laughs> and I'm the guy that kind of spots. So... I saw this guy, and uh, um, he was small, but I just looked at his body, and I'm like, man, that looks like a fucking wrestler. It's just something about him, and he's finding his shit, but I just kind of feel like, you know when you look at someone, you feel it's a ticking time bomb? So I kept an eye on and it was basketball season. Of course, the basketball players they were there, and they're big and picking a little dude. So long story short, little guy goes in. They pushed him. He goes, does a double leg, lift the basketball player up, and try to drop him to the side. His head banged on the bar stool, going down. So it was a good kicking. Now me, I was like, yes, watching that. I was like, oh, get that asshole. But I got to defuse this. <laughs> when I went to him, Oh, man, he was ready to shoot. And when he shot, and it was just your typical sport, just hands down, blocked it. And when I pulled them up, immediately I said, I'm not the guy you want to fight. I'm trying to get you out of here before it gets worse. I saw everything. It diffused him fast. But I'm telling you, when I see him grab, he already clinched. I'm like, man, if I didn't have, it was just a sudden reaction. Now, if he asked me I was fall on the street or anything, it just happened. It, it was that that I'm like, because he the way he was going and angry, I know if he double legged me, he would have shot me at the end of the damn uh, club <laughs> to the wall because <laughs> <laughs> he had that bull rock. I'm like, oh, here it comes. So that's, I tell you, that that was <laughs> one that I was very grateful. And he just kicked in. It just kicked in. It wasn't planned. It wasn't anything. You're son like, oh, shit. Arms yeah. down. Just a block. Yeah. And so... Yeah, and you said you've never, never really had to to throw any punches sort nope. of in the time on the doors either. Have, have you had people obviously take swings at you? I imagine oh, as well. Oh, a lot of times, you know. The good thing about you know, one thing I've I've got to admit is that head movement have been also. There's difference between just head movement, head movement with reality, because I teach them. I watch them. You get this giant like six foot seven swinging. Oh, just copy your head and go. Is that like, now? That's six foot seven. <laughs> I'm 5'7". This is coming down. It's going to bring my head to the floor. <laughs> so <laughs> when you see them do the pad work without the reality, it's good. But I've, I'm lucky, especially when I, I train dirty boxing. Um, Muay Thai was Muay Thai. I love it. But to me, as I get older and the more I've been out and the damages in my feet, I don't want to get, I don't want to kick. I just don't want to kick anymore. If it's short kicks, you know, I used to be a kicker. But So dirty boxing have been something that helped me. And every now and then I would kind of check on it. But especially with hip movement, hand movement, all that dirty boxing is real good. Especially you can get that when you train in Filipino art. They got good dirty boxing techniques. And I, I'm a big, big heavy on it, to be honest with you. If somebody trains grappling and dirty boxing, they'll be good. Yeah, tell, tell us, um, I, th I think I know what you mean by dirty boxing, but tell us, tell us what that is exactly. So dirty boxing uh, should be a big thing with you guys down in there. <laughs> That's how I got introduced when I was in England. And... Uh, but dirty boxing, it's just dirty as it is. It's just more not your typical, you know, sports boxing. You know, elbows are involved, sneaking in, even uppercuts with the cuts in it. And it's it's very rugged, but it's to the point. And we're not sitting just two, two, well, three, four, and two, three, four. Yeah, you know, it's a, even you clinch Get with your head yeah. butts. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. What do you think of, um, just going on a slight tangent, but obviously um, you've seen a sort of bare knuckle FC break onto mm. the scene recently. What are your thoughts on that as a sport? Man, 
First thought is brain damage. <laughs> I have so much concussions on that, to be honest with you. Um, it's tough, you know, but it's also, I mean, here's, here's where the only thing, if I want to say, other than my character, the damage is of the head, you know, somebody living with it and just going through it all my life, it, you know, it does a lot. That's kind of one of my negative things about it. Now, the other negative point of view I see, it sometimes give a little bit of a weird velocity to people. They think, oh, I can get punched 50 times in the face and I'm still standing. No, not really. You know? I mean, it's tough. And I watch it. It's tough. It's tough. But I don't know if it's necessary. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you got to be a fucking, you got to have a screw loose to do it. You know, I don't go out of my way to watch it if it's on or bored and I see it. And I have friends in those fights that even do it and even some female friends. And I'm like, man. Oh, yeah, it looks, it looks nasty. It really does. I, I know Joe Rogan's talked previously about how the, the, the gloves do more harm than good because the gloves are, uh, facilitate people being able to punch you harder. But I think the ham wraps do a pretty good job of securing your hands to a degree as well. But if you notice, it, it's correct to what you said. You don't see a lot of knockouts in BFC. If you, if you notice, there's no that's that big coming in. As with the glove, yeah, people hit way harder because there's not that constraint of the pain in the hand. And this is why when I even teach self-defense, and this is crazy, every time you see people on the fight, they want to punch. I was like, if you punch your skull, you're going to break your hand. I mean, you know, one of the most famous... Uh, um, thing always, and I say this, and a lot of my mentors have said this in the past, and the, there's a medical uh, term that's been coined because of boxers getting in fights and breaking their hands. It's called the boxer's fracture. You know, when boxers get into street fights, they always break their hands. Why? They don't have wraps. They don't have gauze. They don't have the glove that just gives them to get every hit out of their heart without damaging their hand. They go outside, somebody throws a fist, and I just duck, and he hits the, my top of my skull. Yes, I might get a headache, but he just broke his hand. And that's why in self-defense, when I see him hitting and boxing, I was like, yeah. And we make sometimes our students punch without pads, and afterward they're like, ow. I was like, yeah, that's why you should use palm heels. Yeah, and uh, we've got an episode going out on Monday, actually, which is with uh, John Davis, who's um, the slap power slap middleweight champion Oof. and uh talk about brain damage there oh my god man yeah well to, to be honest though we had we had a conversation with him about this and you know he he felt that there wasn't that much of a risk compared to other sports because they only actually hit each other five times maybe twice a year whereas with something like even soccer where they're heading the ball or with obviously boxing where you're sparring and taking the constant regular blows um so yeah, he he didn't he didn't feel it was necessarily uh, a, a danger for him. But one thing we did talk about though was obviously the amount of power you can generate with an open palm strike or oh, slap. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. and prior to that really going off recently, I I don't think I had an appreciation for how hard you can hit somebody mm -hmm. with just an open palm. I, I didn't think you could knock someone out like that. No, like like <laughs> those big boys going down where they're getting rocked. I'm like, fuck. Oh yeah, hell, no, there is a technique to it. Oh, it's it's, yeah, it's great yeah. technique, isn't it? The, the, I mean, power slaps are power slaps, man. It, it, I, I was, I was like that in the beginning. <laughs> so I was, I was like, you know, I was like everybody in the beginning, and because I was a puncher, but yeah, power slaps. I've, I've, I've seen, <laughs> I've, I've seen. Yeah, I think it's when you get slapped and you get KO'd by it, and you're on the floor. You're like, man. <laughs> yeah, it's mad, and uh, and obviously you've got. Um, <laughs> Combat, what's it? What do you call it? Uh, combat jiu jitsu as well. Yeah, combat yes, jiu -jitsu, yeah. yes. Let me look at that. Yeah, and, and again, I've seen some. You know, sort of like May got knocked out, didn't he? Oh, in, in mm -hmm. from the guard, from the guard. Mm -hmm. Just put him in the guard. And he was like, slap him, and he was like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I think I about like, it. His his hips was not even engaged in it, and he no, caused. I, I watched right. one, and I saw the video, and I was telling my son, I was like, Is that bare knuckle FC? Because the dude was all bloody. He's like, no, Dad, that was a slap jujitsu. I was like, how did he hit him that hard? Bust? I mean, the guy's face was ripped. He got hit. I was like, ooh, if that's from the ground and he hit him that hard, I don't want to stand up for that person to slap <laughs> me like that. Looked like a bear mauled his face. Oh, it was, I was shocked. I know they can do damage, but from that, from the ground like that, with no hips engaged in it, 
I was very surprised the amount of damage yeah. right there. And I, I like that slack combat jiu-jitsu because I think it adds the realism. You know, you're you're sitting on the floor and you think you're pulling guard and you're like, and suddenly he comes side hitting you in the head. You don't want to hold him in guard for too long after that. No, yeah. Yeah, I got the shit beaten out of me yesterday. <laughs> 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 no doubt no doubt yeah. I got the shit beaten out of me if it was slapped right? so I got a question for you guys so the, in England what is the, the popular martial art now is it Jiu Jitsu or what is it exactly yeah I think so it, it feels that way for sure um, growing up so you know I grew up in the sort of uh, I was born in 82 so uh, you know sort of growing up in the, the late 80s 90s it was boxing um, mm -hmm. certainly in the areas where I grew up everybody boxed I think boxing was up until recent, well, fairly recently, really. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, still a lot of boxing gyms around, isn't there? Yeah, so you still get the amateur boxing clubs about, especially in deprived areas where there's not a lot of money because it's very cheap to to do. Um, but yeah, jujitsu for sure is is becoming incredibly popular now, and and you know our academy is is you know as a facility is absolutely stunning. Um, yeah, where I, I probably first dabbled with jujitsu maybe in two thousand and seven, I think. Um, so a long time ago originally and, and back then you know it was very much in the basement on a dirty mat you know as, as you'd expect and it's it's come on leaps and bounds um, but yeah I think jiu-jitsu or probably MMA as well if you want to consider that as a singular martial art and primarily that's because of the UFC and and obviously during the pandemic I think because they were pretty much the only sport still going because they obviously went yeah. out to Yaz Island yeah um, I think that that did a lot of good. That was a stroke of genius, that was. Yeah. That was, that was. But that, but that did a lot of good, I think, for jiu-jitsu because a lot of people, that was probably, they would have watched that and they hadn't done before and then they, you know, they, they saw that. But also there's a lot of um, British celebrities and, and social media authorities that are now really oh, into yeah. jiu-jitsu. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, You know, yes. like James, James Smith, who's a fitness guy, he's really into it. Uh, Russell Brand, who's a, who's a British comedian, is really Tom into Hardy, it. Tom Hardy, I think. Tom, 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 yeah. Yeah, competing yeah. and everything. That, that he surprised me. He surprised me. Yeah, he's an actual animal, isn't he? He loves yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a, do you know what? He just comes across as like a normal bloke, doesn't he? That's why. Yeah, when I saw him competing, and I was like, "Who the hell wanna sit across of him, man?" Just thinking, I was like, "That's Tom Hardy." <laughs> but you know, they you know get the point. This is I've told my son this, and I say it to my beginner students, I'm, and for some reason. The older I get, I've noticed I've been enjoying teaching beginners. I don't know why. <laughs> but in jiu-jitsu, though, uh, not, not in crap at all. I, I just I refuse. <laughs> I refuse. <laughs> just, you know, having, you know, Sally stand up and do her part. And I, I, I've done my years. I was like, you guys do that. But <laughs> in jiu-jitsu, if you think about it, what sports out there that you can just sit by the Michael Jordan of your sport while you're watching a, a grappling tournament? You know, like you can go to IBJJF and see one of your idols and heroes and, you know, found, you know, and you're like, hey, that's so and so. And he could be sitting watching the same thing and no issue. And I think Jiu Jitsu has that cool part that you can, for some reason, I'm not saying the word accessible. But some of our role models in the art and the sport now, they want to call it, you can still see them around. And it, how, how long do you think that's going to be for, though? Like, I, I was thinking about this the other day. How, because jujitsu is growing so fast, and it is yeah. growing fast, how these top guys, like the next wave of, of lads coming through, uh, do you think they will go to that next level? Do you think they'll, they'll make. I don't know, ADCC or, or some sort of competition, like kind of like UFC. I know they're doing like the fight pass invitationals and obviously you got one championship. I don't know. I just think, I was thinking this the other day about the podcast and other things, like how accessible are these people going to be in five or 10 years, you know, because UFC guys now, I, I you know, you can't get out of them. You know, they are yeah. they are celebrities. Yeah. I don't think the, the jiu-jitsu guys are too far behind. Well, now two things I would say. One, I agree with you, and so not far beyond. But if you notice, the, I think there's something about the jujitsu demeanor that's just, they're still kind of accessible, that they still have that connection. I'm not God on earth. I'm not saying everybody is the same. I have met some dickheads, even like legit Brazilian jujitsu dickheads. I was like, I would never deal with that dickhead ever again. I don't care what people <laughs> think he is on his seminar. Fuck this guy, you know? So yeah. we got those. But I think, like I said, jujitsu is kind of different in that mentality. Like there's that chill vibe 
And just, I don't know, I don't know if it's just equality, but it's just something about it. When you see another practitioner that even if, you know, stop on you, some I like this and I like that, there's communications. Now the other ones, yeah. So I think it's going to still be there in some level, Daddy. I just think it depends. I, I think it all depends on the money. I think if they if yeah. it builds up to a point where the money comes in, you know, even from somewhere like Saudi or someone from the Middle East, yeah. or, you know, if they oh, start that's going to be the next real money there. into it, you know, I see that. I was there. Mainstream. Absolutely. When you mentioned Saudi, I see when I was there, well, jiu-jitsu jiu-jitsu just started jiu at its you know beginning. I mean? You know how it starts in each country. So they're starting the small dojos, the little Gracie combative guys got in with his blue belt. I see him there. And of course there's the gym that they act like the MMA guys for some reason. I just came in, me and my son, he's a blue belt, I'm a brown belt. I think they Googled me or something, and I try to get in, and he's like, you need membership. I was like, I'm only in the country for a month or two. I can be, you know, can you? No. And I'm like, all right, it's one of those. So <laughs> they they felt intimidated, or I might see something wrong. But And, and that's the thing is, and I want to hamper Brazilians, but we call them the uh, overseas black belts. You know, this purple belt suddenly is a purple belt, he's a black belt in some country because he's Brazilian. And... So we, there, I feel that's happened there, just like how jiu-jitsu went down in Abu Dhabi. Jiu-jitsu was the first there. And now if you notice, they pulled it out. It used to be in their curriculums, everything, it went to shit. And unfortunately, there is a cultural thing amongst the Brazilian jiu-jitsu in Brazil that they would do this. And unfortunately, they come in to open the gyms, not running right, or money is owed, and, and people are not right correctly, and there it goes. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting point. I think you're both right, actually, to some degree. And I've got this uh, this this theory, and yeah, again, I'll be interested in your perspective, Fras. But I think with like a lot of combat sports, certainly that are striking based. You know, when I boxed, there was always that like big, strong builder that would come in that was just mean and horrible, and he'd beat the shit out of you, even though you were better, <laughs> and like just bully you into submission, and you you avoided like the plague and. Because of his physical attributes and his mentality, he always had this like this high status in in the in the gym or in the club. And I found that with Thai boxing to some extent as well. Um, and I feel that like maybe even with like I don't know, like wrestling, perhaps you get that where you get these just these absolute athletic specimens. Mm-hmm. Whereas I find with jujitsu, for the most part, I think even if someone is very athletic, you know, they're still going to get tuned up by you know the sort of the purple brown mm-hmm. black belts in the mm-hmm. academy, right? So there's a humbling, I think, that happens in jiu-jitsu that maybe doesn't happen in a lot of other combat sports. And I think that's why a lot of the, you know, the the, the really top-end guys are, are so nice. And you talk about the equality because they, they've been they've been there. They've been through. They that. have an appreciation for where you are right now. But I also think the money thing's going to have an impact because people will suddenly go, you know, I'm worth this much. You know, I put a price on my time. And if you want to have a conversation with me, you need to pay for my time. I actually, yeah, now I see what you're saying because I have, I can't remember who, but it's one of those. And I think that goes back again to what Danny said. Um, like I say, I'm a guy that can agree. And uh, um, this guy half posted about how he felt he's so accessible and now making it where he's at. He's like, I am asking for my time. So, Yeah. I can I can um, uh, see where 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 can that happen more and more. I think as, and, as and, soon and, as they start getting more crowds and bits and pieces, I think that's what it will change. Now I tell you also another problem we have, and it's social media. Now, for instance, you know I got followers on that, and sometimes I, I want to focus because I make money with my social media, and it helps me in a lot of things how to reach out. And, but. Um, it can get overwhelming, and I'm not being one of those people, but people think they got such direct access to you because of social media and DMs that it becomes like a demand. And suddenly you get run into it that you feel you should be responding or because, you know, this might be. And I had to catch myself because I've been working a lot, working a lot lately. And then Addison was like, man, this is a lot to deal with. I, I plugged off one weekend and just looking at the numbers of the DMs I got, I was like, this is insanity. <laughs> so yeah. but if i look at it and some people don't respond to we'll have some snarky comments which doesn't make sense to me but it does make them feel they got they got accessibility to you so i think we all get that don't we now like even with our our podcast and stuff you get 
comments and DMs and you know if I if if I don't look at our DMs for a couple of days it'll rack up you know and you think, yeah you know, yeah like, yeah I was like and then yeah and when you drop all the DMs and there's some important DMs you don't know it just goes all the way down then one day you send this fellow a message you're like oh shit he sent me a message in January I didn't even look at yeah. <laughs> and then they get mad at you so yeah yeah but it is yeah it's, it's a very true point I'd not even really thought about it that much until you just said but. You know, in the, in the in the good old days, someone would have, would have to access your number to get in touch with you. Yeah, friends. exactly. It's like, and who is this? <laughs> now they just DM you on anything. They find you on WhatsApp. They find you on everything, you know? So, <laughs> email. Yeah. We get emails, don't we? Constant it's fucking almost, emails. It's almost going to be end, end up being like a hot girl in a bar mentality, isn't it? Where... You know, they just get approached by every single guy in the place. So <laughs> yeah. when you try and speak to them, they're just so dismissive of you because they're just fed up with it. And I guess yeah, you know, get to that point. I was telling my son, and he's laughing. As a bodyguard, I used to help to get the weight, get these fans away. And then I got proud but wait. So now when we start doing this pro wrestling thing with my son, we're indie league level, you know. But I forgot how annoying it is when you're sitting at brunch and somebody comes up to you like Man, that was the show two nights ago. What the hell you want now? You know, <laughs> but it, it gets to that level. I'm not. I'm not acting as we are Mr. Famous. But you know, when we did the show in Saudi, it took the first two weeks for things to settle for not getting annoyed going anywhere, and we're not just an independent level, but it was one of the big ones we did there, and to, it got, became recognizable. And I even told my kid, I was like, "Man, this this can get annoying." Now I know. Should not be telling what these people are doing, not doing it, you know? So, yeah, they get tired of it. They get tired of it. And sometimes we treat the DMs as this person coming. This person, you know, could be never talk to me and just want to say, and I'm already fed up about the 100 DMs from people texting me. Mate, just a, a quick one before we go. <laughs> yes. Uh, a little bit off topic. What's What's it been like, obviously, growing up in Saudi and then to what it's like now from the outside? It looks, obviously, it's changed quite a lot. What do you... What, what's your perspective on all that? So I grew up doing the old regime when things were really hard, you know, and uh, I got back to Saudi after my dad passed away and got permission to get back because all my documents and everything were blacked out. And to just see myself walking around like tatted out like that and not cause a scene. And I still got a habit when I first got to the airport, an official met me and it was a woman. So I'm talking to her, not looking at her, out of respect from how it was back then. You can't maintain. And she looked at me and she said in English, she was like, Mr. Azab, you know you can look at me. I just looked at her, I was like, my apologies. I'm used to, she said, I totally get it when I saw your date. <laughs> 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 your date of birth. So that that was a shock, you know, just to be approached and you can talk, you know, hey, sister, a normal, without it a scene. And it's just seeing the growth and you see it, the change and how they are to me, I'm me with my son in downtown Jeddah attending a Wu Tang Clan concert. It's just off my head. So cool. <laughs> That's what so we did, cool. you know, in January. I was like, I'm with my 20 year old son at the age of 46 watching a Wu Tang concert in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where everybody is, if you want to be covered, you're covered. You don't want to be covered, you don't. And there was everybody there, any kinds, whatever believer cultures. And I'm like, it works. It works. You know, it's as a kid, you know, I missed that part. And I noticed my generation are being children down there because they're like enjoying these. I go, you go to a concert and it's all a bunch of us old farts. <laughs> <laughs> we, we might have dragged our kids with us, but they don't know who the hell is this. It's even the money that they put into like football and stuff. It's crazy, crazy it numbers. And the it's Saudi crazy. league now is obviously like grown huge amounts so obviously having Ronaldo yeah. out there and Benzema and honestly mate they just they just bought you know pretty much everyone they could in the summer I and, never um, expected it people to be must that be way love at it. all people must Shocking. love it out there it must be it must be just so so weird to be suppressed for so long and then have all this freedom and be able to do stuff and have amazing football teams and just yeah I just I was really interested in seeing what you know so what you, what you be, can, that's a good point you point out Daniel so Here's what a lot of people don't understand. So when you just said, you know, being suppressed for so long, suddenly the door opened, how did they manage? Well, think about it, Danny. I would tell you 70%, I would push it to 80% of the culture there is Western educated. 
So they're propped when the doors open. It was that 20 some percent that just comes off of, like you say, we call them the tribal or the villagers or the mountain okay, people. Yeah. But these were the ones also supported with the prime, uh, or the current regime and there were fanatical moments about it. Now they are the ones you can notice they're trying to adapt. Now we're all kind, you know, I mean, it's a tribal person. I'm going to be mad how he raised up. You know, it is what it is. So I'll tell you the instance, a, a funny story. I'm sitting in the mall with my son. And, uh, I know it's, it's bad humor, but having a coffee and I'm watching and I'm laughing. My son's like, dad, what's your life? And I was like, let me show you here. So I'm educating him because my son just came to the, uh, Saudi Arabia and got his citizenship about a year ago. He'd never been there. He never knew about that country because I never thought we will be back. So here's a guy you can tell he is from the tribal outskirts areas. He's sitting in the middle of the mall and dressed up, you know, trying to look, you know, to fit in because I'm in Jeddah. We're kind of considered very modernized there since back then. He is totally fascinated by this humongous screen. I think he thinks it's magic. Like something is because you can say when he move, when things move, he's moving his head. <laughs> so I felt bad in a way. You see the advancement, how fast the country is going. And, uh, and all of them are coming because with the new Prince Initiative, he's forcing them for jobs. They got to come to the cities. So they're trying. It's almost like when you watch that movie uh, back in the day, Coming to America. That's literally some of them coming in. <laughs> and more like, that, you know, that's a great uh, fucking film. Uh, I know, yeah, no, and I'm classic. telling you, it, it looks like that. I sit and observe and I laugh. But, you know, back the sad part, though, these were the people back then in the old regime, they even looked down at us that was more westernized and believed that we shouldn't be fully covered because that's not what they, even the religion does. And, and to be shocking... To be at my age right now in Saudi, and let's say the prayers went on, and I, I looked at them, I was there, and my cousin left. I was like, oh, my God, you've been away for so long. Like I was like, oh, they're going to close the store or the cafe? He's like, what are you talking about? I was like, it's prayer time. He's like, sit your ass, finish your coffee. Nobody's going to yell at you. I was like, really? I was like, do you, do you used to get sticks and chase us if we don't go pray? He's like, no, nobody does that shit. Just be respectful <laughs> and don't turn music on. And people want to pray, who pray. And if the store is open, it's open that. So that's really It's a though, crazy, it? crazy uh, change. Is it, is it Saudi that are building that strip? Is it like a strip of like like a whole new city in a in a in a line? Have you heard about that? Yeah. Is that, is that in Saudi or was that is that in Dubai? Or it's in Saudi. Or? It's in Saudi. It's in Saudi, isn't it? I thought it was yeah. in Saudi. Yeah. That looks incredible. Have you seen that? No, so they nobody, are nobody can go there. A lot of these like, new project cities, you can't 10K. go see it yet. So. It's like a 10K strip or something like that, isn't it? And it's going to be completely self-sufficient in a straight line. And it's going to have, yeah, it's going to have everything. In the middle of the desert, like, yep. I don't know, it looks fucking insane. It looks something like Star Trek, mate. It looks absolutely, like when they build that, it's going to be something to go and visit just because it's going to be so amazing. It's crazy how they surpassed us in technology because I was there and... Even to get my ID and all that stuff, it was so technologically advanced, not like here. And I'm like, how did we go? Like the United States, we call the leaders of the freedom world. We went so backward, yet the country that was surpassed are going so forward. I mean, look what they did to the what because they're doing they've got to boxing, direction, mate. They've got one direction. That's the yes. difference. Is is Absolutely. the Western world? We've all got 500 directions. You can't say fucking anything because you'll get slandered. You get this, and everyone's scared to talk. Whereas in Saudi and places like that, you know, you've got a leader and if he's a progressive leader like they are now, they, mm -hmm. they've got one direction that they're going to go in. And because they put all their efforts into those directions, you know, they, they realize that they'll, they'll surpass us. I'm, I'm 100 years from now, it won't be the same as it is now. They'll surpass yeah. the Western world with what they're building and the way they're going and their morals and the religion and, and their discipline. That's the other thing as well. Very disciplined. You know, it, we, we, we lose all our discipline. In the Western world, they're, they're so disciplined, you know, because, well, it's just the way they're brought up. And, and those traditions will always carry on because of religion. It's, um, I've noticed that and it was heartwarming. I, for a longest time, I lost my spirituality and got back to it. And I, the reason I lost it, because it was handed down during a fanatical moment. And there was a resistance in a lot of us cause of it, you know. But now, to be honest with you, I become more devout Muslim because of how now it's presented. It's now presented in its rightful form. It's now presented as a self-religion 
it's not something I got to chase and tell you, you know, because you are not Muslim, me and you should not be talking, or I should not be on the same podcast, you know, by, by two enemies of their religion, you know, or any of the fault or sitting here judging, judging. No, no, be yourself, focus on yourself. Day of judgment, everybody has their thing. This is not your shit. And it's crazy how to see that changed. Now, I will tell you, I was terrified to death going to the holy mosque and to do my pilgrimage with all this. And I'm shocked to see so much kind officials that used to be chasing us and putting our heads in jail to open ways for us. And I'm like, well, I guess the religion wasn't wrong. It was people. You, you know, I was a child when I grew up and to my teenage years, we're all, rebe you know, rebellions, especially in our high school time. And you have these people that was forcing us to do things that even didn't compute to me. It's like, how is this supposed to be good? How is this, you know, if I'm forcing and beating people, now you see the religion growing is because how it's presented. Nobody, and it's, I've never told you something, if Danny goes to question what stood out, I'll tell you this was mostly. I, I've never been as devout as I am now just because of now seeing it at the form of kindness, seeing it of being a humble, not judgmental. It was very judgmental. Oh, my God. I'm, I got a fiancé that lives down there. She works with Saudi Airlines. And to see her, me and her walking and not seeing a religious police calling her a whore just because she's not covering – or to be at such peace. I've seen so many young generation dating down there, and it's just the natural. But goes back to what Danny said, though. There's a key word to what he said. The discipline, the culture, and the religion is still there. They have no issues what you do in your private. If you're homosexual or whatever, that girl, I've seen them even in class. You can tell when you see somebody. But there was something evident that I liked than the culture in the Western. Self-respect and how to be in public. You, you don't see a man tonguing a woman. You don't see my mom. What, nobody cares. Keep it to yourself. Present yourself in class. They're very family driven. So you always think about who's watching me that, as an example, not because I'm doing anything illegal or anything. So that goes back to what Danny said. Absolutely that is what brought me the pride again in me, the admiration and to get closer back to my religion, just watching it working in its natural essence, not force. That's and what I was about to say. It's not forced on you. You want to want yeah. to practice it. You know, that's and a you huge can tell you, you see the youngs that rebel. You can see it. That's fine. You know, they'll be dressed in there. They got their emo clothing and their golf period <laughs> going on. But it's good to see that natural process. We're not all dressed the same. We're not all thinking the same. But at the end, it's crazy. I was talking to a friend. They can do all the whacked out stuff, but then at the end, they got a conscious of like, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. That doesn't look good to go. You know, so there's always, even when they fuck up, they always go, it's like, yeah, I'm going to get face caught this way. <laughs> so it's not <laughs> conscious. It's hilarious. You see them do some stupid shit, but then you see the second thought kicks in like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sounds pretty awesome. I have to uh, get myself out of there pretty soon, mate. Yeah, you guys should come down, man. There's a lot of very people go there. And, you know, we're, they're always good with their... Uh, I've seen so many tourists the last time that it was shocking to me because we were not a tourist area only if you had a work visa. I mean, most of us go to UK a lot. That's what I love. But just to see it the other way around and they're having a good time and they're not scared and nobody is... It's, 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 it's just... It's, it's, it's nice. It's nice so people finally get to see what the real culture is. And who the people are. So, because, you know, back in the day, we were all similar. They thought we were all like Bin Laden. I'm like, no, man. <laughs> awesome. Fraz, we'll let you go in a second, mate. Is there anything that you want to kind of mention, services or sponsors or anything you want to shout out before we let you go? Um, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I appreciate you, first of all, to have this. I had a great time here. Hopefully, see you guys again for sure. But you guys got a good thing going, and I, I, I like it. I was like, when you guys hit me up, I was like, man, I like the show. I, I, I think it's it. But yeah, check me out. I mean, I got all um, well, of my DVDs. People ask me about them, and they're on BJJ Fanatic. You just Google my name. I mean, search my name when you go there. And if you're in doing jiu-jitsu and trying to see how to translation up some jiu-jitsu to the streets, check out some of the library I got down there. I got three good DVDs with them. And it would be great. So hopefully we'll get some more people checking it out and we'll get the reviews coming in. 
Yeah, 100%. Fras, I've really enjoyed this conversation, mate. It was really good fun. Thank you. Same way. I appreciate it. Thank you.